How many people did it take to build the Great Pyramid? The estimates as to how this was done are pretty dramatic and don't logically weigh up or make sense, especially if you consider a 10 hour working day and the need for a placement of a block every two minutes for 25 years. Something isn't adding up. How do we assume the 25 year timeline anyway? These figures are taken from two sources. The first being the reign of Khufu, he reigned for at least 23 years according to the Turin Papyrus and this would mean the pyramid would need to be envisioned, planned out, the work being carried out and complete before the king's death. This is what the history books teach us despite the fact that engineers and architects the world over tell us that a hundred years to carry out such a project would be a push, never mind one generation. The fact of the matter is that our education system is pushing on the boundaries of what we will accept as logical. Just because we are told something happened, it doesn't mean it actually happened. And the evidence in the case of Khufu, being a king who ordered the construction of the Great Pyramid, is one that is forcing the hand of the civilized people of the earth. How can we believe something so outlandish that if we were to believe this, then we would be letting down future generations in our understanding of things that have went before. The Greek historian Herodotus tells us of his understanding. Remember, Herodotus had access to the history books of the Egyptian civilization at Alexandria, so his understanding could be conveyed as more of an overview as he visited 2000 years after the reign of Khufu. Herodotus tells us that this is written that 100,000 men completed the pyramid in 20 years. He tells us this 2,000 years after Khufu reigned and the texts he takes his knowledge from are no longer in existence. 100,000 men at work on the Giza Plateau would have been a mega operation and it is entirely unclear how they fed these workers, housed them, clothed them and their families. This would have been enormous. A population of pyramid builders that would have been equivalent to the population of Cairo City in 1800. What about the tools used in the working of the very hard raw materials used? Well, what if we were to tell you guys that such a tool has never been found? It has long been assumed that the use of chisels and hammers in the shaping of stone, but no such tools have ever been found ever. The fact of the matter is that we are confronted with evidence of the use of advanced technology at these locations. How ancient builders cut through granite and basalt like butter is the most perplexing questions in existence. How they then move these very dense stones is another brain buster, but the cutting and drilling that we still see present of the Giza Plateau means that whatever they use must have been harder than quartz minerals that granite is composed of. This suggests the use of a diamond as that is what we use to cut granite today with one exception. The ancient cuts are more accurate than the modern cuts under a microscope, further adding to the massive enigma. The historian and scholar Ab al Latif tells us that in the 12th century, the Great Pyramid is covered with an indecipherable language. This is probably dynastic hieroglyphics and this is a great clue in our understanding of the Great Pyramid because this tells us that it survives mostly intact to the 12th century. It still had its casing at this time and apparently it was covered with glyphs shortly after it was stripped for the purposes of building Cairo City until the casing was gone. Important stones like the Rosetta Stone has since been recovered as building material, but the true scale of the loss of the ancient stone documents is out of this world. By the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, the Old Kingdom had already been forgotten about. The knowledge had already been forgotten and this seems to confuse Middle Kingdom rulers somewhat. Khufu the King was already a character from history as opposed to still having an influence at all and 550 after this king reigned, his reliefs and hieroglyphic inscriptions seem to have almost vanished from time. The Great Pyramid as we now know has no inscription whatsoever with the exception of the fake cartouche that attributes it to Khufu. These pyramids on the Giza Plateau are remnants of an era that was already bygone to the dynastic Egyptians including Khufu. It should strike the viewers of the Lost History Channel as an absolute assumption that Khufu built the pyramid within this time frame. 
We get the range from his reign of 23 years, despite this being impossible, and we get Khufu as a king from the compiling by Manitho of a king list that is still the basis for all framework in our dating of the Egyptian kings. This is despite Manetho living two centuries after Herodotus and his original kings list being lost, but translations written. We rely on this despite it being inaccurate, to a degree of being impossible regarding the old kingdom of Egypt and Khufu. This characterization and grouping of the 30 dynasties are probably just popular tradition of the following dynasties trying to recall the old kingdom. Many ancient stories surround the Great Pyramid of Giza. One of our favorites is that of the story of King Surid, who lived three centuries before the Great Flood. The king was bothered by his dreams he would have in which he sees chaos on the land and only those who would join the Lord of the Boat would survive. The presence of the solar barge at the Great Pyramid and the association of Ra with the solar barge has eerie echoes of the story of Noah. Arab legend maintains that the Great Pyramid was the tomb of Hermes, the Greek counterpart of the god Thoth. Just like the King Surid, he built the pyramid to preserve science and literature after the Great Flood. Faith, it gives us the confidence to question the past. If you know the worth of having a certain belief in a certain thing, then this can allow the certainty in which we wonder when promises are made and measures are bound you can be sure that a man with faith will have the heart of a lion, the territorial beast that stalks its prey. Be very careful when disturbing a resting soldier of faith. Where exactly are all the statues of much celebrated King Khufu, builder of the largest stone structure in the world? The mighty King Khufu that ordered the construction of the most perplexing monument on the entire planet, the greatest building ever constructed. Here it is. This tiny statuette is the only statue of the great Khufu, the king that they are telling us built the Great Pyramid despite no evidence existing to prove this. This wasn't even found at Giza where the Great Pyramid was built. It was found in 1903 by Flinders Petrie at Abydos, 336 miles away from Giza according to the most advanced measurements we have today. How the hell is it that the guy that commanded so much power seriously juiced up with more power than Donald Trump and Boris Johnson combined, overloaded with an eye-watering command of the ancient world, yet all of the colossus statues dedicated to seemingly minor kings who done close to nothing in comparison, yet this tiny three and a half inch statue is all there is with his image. It wasn't even found intact. The head was missing. They found it one month later and attached it to the throne. The strange ears as well have long been a talking point of the weirdness and the head, which is somewhat too large with respect to the body, is adorned with the red crown of the delta connected to the head. The face of the king is expressionless. He is wearing a short kilt and his right half is naked with his right hand holding a flail over his right breast and his left hand rests on his thigh. The statuette is identified as Khufu, king of the fourth dynasty, by the Ka name of the king inscribed on the right side of the throne. Petrie immediately dated this statuette to the fourth dynasty on the basis of the name inscribed on the throne. Convincing all subsequent archaeologists and art historians of the validity of his assertion and dismissing as superfluous any thoughts of comparison with 4th Dynasty sculpture. There is a clear dating problem. We are still relying on scant references from foreign sources to Egypt to assert the dynasties. In fact, it was the priest of the Ptolemies who compiled the list of the Egyptian kings. He was a Greek priest to the Egyptian pharaoh of the last dynasty. His sources from which his knowledge is taken are completely unknown, yet this is what we are using as a foundation in our understanding of who the dynastic Egyptians were and when they ruled. It's completely and utterly flawed and anyone can see this based on these evidences. The search for items related to Khufu has drawn a blank. The association with the Great Pyramid is mind-boggling. 
Egyptologists assert that the Khufu cartouche must have been placed where it is before the block was set at the Great Pyramid. Unfortunately, a tirade of uncertainty surrounds these inscriptions that have been proved to carbon date to the 9th century AD, 4,500 years after Khufu reigned. Now, we're not saying Khufu wasn't a king. Of course, he probably did exist, but nothing really survives at all regarding his existence. This is a force fitting of history into a contextual grouping for popular belief. In fact, Egyptology would have us believe that this is straightforward, that the fake cartouche and the tiny broken statue are enough evidence both of Khufu's existence and that he built the Great Pyramid because his mark is apparent in this chamber. Evacuated by gunpowder in 1837, one mark apparently read year 17. And this has been taken to mean that the pyramid had reached that level in the 17th year of the king's reign. Did they fully complete the rest in the next six years? The entire casing, polishing, etc. Of course, they take this with the well-documented Khufu cartouche and say that, well, these blocks must have been placed here after the inscriptions were made because some of them are upside down. These are the only inscriptions inside the ancient monument of any kind whatsoever. The only evidence to attribute the pyramid to Khufu, or at least a king called Khufu. Gaston Maspero, the French Egyptologist, says, Without the cartouche, we should never have known to whom the Great Pyramid belonged. We still don't. According to the Pyramid Odyssey, there is a problem with these inscriptions. One being that they are not the only inscriptions in the revealing chambers. There are much, much more inscriptions that reads Kunam Kuf. On the rocks of Sinai, again, we see these inscriptions and because of this, it raises stubborn questions that will only be answered with further discovery of the ancient things. Kunam is an ancient Egyptian god who was the god of the Nile inundation from Elephantine, where he guarded the first cataract. It is possible that the king Khufu was named after the Great Pyramid and not the other way around. The name Kunam Khuf cannot be a simple variant of the name Khufu because it suggests that the most important king was that of Kunam Khuf and that Khufu was a lesser king. This suggests to us that the builder of the Great Pyramid is the king Kunam Khuf. This is a variant of the name for the god Kunam. It was the god Kunam who built the masterpiece. But again, we are confronted by a problem. Because this is presented in history as mythology, this is the stuff they are telling us they simply dreamt up. The fact that exact inscriptions that exist in ancient form on the rocks of Sinai are incredibly similar. And the only other example of these inscriptions existing next to each other, could Richard Weiss have detailed his findings here at Sinai before marking these inscriptions inside the pyramid chamber with red paint? Just a thought. One puzzle after another, one person's understanding and the contradiction of the facts have put the Great Pyramid into the spotlight of researchers the world over. As of yet, nobody has concluded what it was. Nobody knows why it was built, but the obvious answer is that it wasn't a tomb for Khufu. This thing, whatever the hell it is, is the most mysterious monument in existence. It seems to tease us, as if the answer is sitting in plain sight, like we already know but can't reach the knowledge or understanding at this particular moment, but we will know one day. For decades, if not centuries, Students have listened to the conjectural thinking of their teachers. They have then spread the conjecture in a meaningful way as if it were fact in the first place. But the fact of the matter is, regarding the historical past, that the exotic assumptions and personal speculation has bewildered the modern world. We today have literally woken to this madness the time of the Egyptians in contrast to what we believe. Is a history known by no one on this earth today? Yet, we are told it is known. The pattern of bewilderment has kept us in the dark. For a time, however, these stories were exchanged between intellectual circles. It wasn't a case of what you may have experienced and rather who could tell the best story about that experience. 
This cultural pattern has proven to have been a toxic splurting of words that spread like a disease across our planet. Theoretical thinking is not a lie either. You must speculate the midst of time to even begin to understand the past. Only by speculating can we arrive at the truth, but not to be confused with the presentation of a lie as a truth. That is different. The ERA of the Pyramid Builders and the Fourth Dynasty is a time present to us and what is known as a fact. When in actual fact, close to nothing is known about these people, and this history has been the victim of groundless assumption that are fed to us as fact. Think about this. Egyptology suggests to us that the name Khufu had become to the dynastic Egyptians of the Middle and New Kingdoms what Jesus Christ is to us in the West today. By the time of the Middle Kingdom, the Old Kingdom was already ancient, forgotten about and re-emergence was occurring. The name Khufu was used as protection and this led to Khufu's seal being etched onto monuments and temples as a sign of protection. They basically are telling us that Khufu was a god who protected them and maybe this is where the confusion regarding the Great Pyramid is spawning from. Maybe Khufu wasn't a king of the 4th dynasty. Instead, perhaps he lived many, many years before this period and that he was actually a god called Kunum. After a period of separation, translations lapsed of the Middle Ages and New Ages inspired the god Kunum as Khufu. Just a thought, and remember this, there are people alive today called Jesus. We don't automatically assume, however, that they are Jesus Christ. Good old Herodotus is responsible for this thinking. He assumed Khufu was a king and such was his standing that he was believed. This, however, was thousands of years after Khufu was said to have been king. It is simply assumed and presented as fact. There are no historical records of these fourth dynasty kings, only the cartouches that represent a translation of their name. The inventory stela that has been classified as a fake by Egyptologists because it says the Great Pyramid already stood at the time of Khufu's reign, but it does tell us that Khufu built the satellite pyramids of the Great Pyramid for his daughters. These smaller pyramids are unlevel, inaccurate, and stepped, similar to the nearby famous step pyramids of Saqqara and completely unlike the Great Pyramid. These satellite pyramids are an effort to replicate the wonder that was well in existence when these were erected. The Great Pyramid is responsible for revolutionary development in construction techniques that have never been replicated. It is the oldest pyramid, the most accurately aligned both to the stars and to the Earth's landmass. It has an apparent function like a working machine that has never been realized and the scale of the monument sees it as the largest stone structure of ancient Egypt. Why don't we know what it is? In the king's chamber there are nine granite beams on the ceiling. This is the largest suspended granite space in the entire world stretching 18 feet and thought to weigh over 40 tons. How did they get these beams in here without the use of crane technology? Engineers tell us this couldn't be done, yet here it is. The nine-ton red granite sarcophagus in this chamber is one of the most mind-boggling features of the Great Pyramid. Some have suggested that the Israelites took the Ark of the Covenant from this location and took it to Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant being a power source of the Great Pyramid's function in this theory. No artifacts, hieroglyphic inscriptions, or anything of any kind whatsoever to give us a clue as to what the pyramid was has ever been found, ever. This room, whatever it is, was sealed to an astonishing megalithic degree that we would be critically stupid to believe it was simply a tomb. The Giza Plateau is a huge limestone plate known as the Makadam Formation and was thought to have formed 56 million years ago. Makadam means cut off or broken off, refers to how the low range of hills is divided into three sections. In the past, the low mountain range was an important ancient Egyptian quarry site for limestone, used in the construction of temples and pyramids. However, the denser granite was shipped to the location from Aswan. More than 7 million limestone blocks with an average weight of 2.5 tons are installed in the three Giza Great Pyramids. Over the blocks, there are the brilliant white limestone slabs the pyramids were originally covered with. 
This white trim was used in medieval times as a quarry and used to build houses in Cairo. Only at the top of the middle pyramid there are remnants of this panel. The Nile River seems to have been the key to transporting the blocks, but this hasn't been replicated despite efforts in 2018 by Channel 4 to prove this method. After the Great Pyramid and indeed the Giza Pyramids were constructed, they were never replicated. This is in spite the fact that they are the oldest pyramids in Egypt. The construction methods regressed and did not improve, and even the Middle Kingdom pharaohs are telling us that they weren't connected to the Old Kingdom. All we are saying is that we begin to adapt our understanding because our timeline of the past doesn't make sense. It's all over the place and the parodying of a thought by a person you trust shouldn't be repeated without known facts. It's fun to speculate but not to present that speculation as if it were actual fact. This practice has left us blinded today. The cosmic engine that is the Great Pyramid was used later as a symbol, a symbol of power. And this is exactly what the Great Pyramid is, a machine to generate power, probably with the use of water from the Nile. Most Egyptologists do believe that the pyramid was a machine. That's the crazy part about the whole misunderstanding. The Great Pyramid, they say, was an instrument of alchemy for transporting the physical being into a cosmic entity. Remember that Pharaoh, as history maintains, was the incarnation of God. The incarnation passes from father to son, as it did with Osiris and Horos. The pyramid, therefore, was the vessel that propelled the entity to the promised land, the Egyptian afterlife. The Great Pyramid, we are told, is the intersection of life and death, where darkness is met with light. They get this idea from the pyramid text, but why would you need such an over-engineered structure for the burial of a king? Is it possible that gods walked among us in the distant past, and that the stories we read in the mythological text are actual representations of past events? We point out the fact that across many different cultures, the same god appears with different names. The Egyptians knew him as Thoth, but across other regions, we see the same god referred to as Enoch, Mercury, Hermes and Tehuti. The god Ra is another example and is known by no fewer than 75 different names. And this brings us back to the relationship between Khufu and Kunam Khuf. Now what if we were to tell you that there is in existence in the so-called mythological inscriptions the appearance of the embodiment of intellect. The god Kimyu just happens to have an alternative name that he is known by, Kunum. These attributions remind us that many names of Thoth across cultures and of course the alternicity in which Ra the sun god is referred in dynastic times of Egypt means that these translations of the old kingdom were already lost in time as the dynasties emerged. The symbol of the god Kimyu is a serpent. This indicates a genius and the name Thoth Hermes was just a generic name and indicates serpents of wisdom. The Book of Thoth protected by the serpent in the Nile and the staff of Hermes is always entwined with the serpents. Moses too held a staff with a serpent during the Exodus. Much is the ongoing mystery surrounding actual symbolism in historical culture, but these are the clues left for us that survive the assault on historical inaccuracies. The fact here is that common ground can be found in the names of Kunum, Khufu, Thoth, Enoch, Mercury and Hermes, yet there is a separation of thousands of years and why has the relationship between Khufu and Hermes been pointed out in the past? Egyptology don't consider Arab accounts of history as being accurate, only that it is fantasized. How arrogant do you need to be to dismiss an entire culture's experience and understanding as being a fantasy? Imagine if American culture was dismissed as never having happened. That is what we are faced with here. They are dismissing history. Maybe it's time to dismiss the dismissers. Just saying. Legends are born of events that have happened. These people had no reason to lie, unlike the early British and French explorers 
who came to the region with money on their mind. The connection with Khufu and Hermes have never arisen before because nobody was looking. When you seek, you find. And remember that Troy was once a legend as well before they rediscovered it. The sands of time and the hand of betrayal in a culture since means we are separated from the builders of the Great Pyramids. We don't know who done this and the ignorance of our current thinking has blinded our understanding of these ancient things. Information has been destroyed. What did survive is misunderstood and the sifting through broken debris that is thousands of years old is what we are now reduced to in our quest to find a foundation of understanding and indeed documentation to support an actual historical timeline. If we were to consider Arab legend and not dismiss it as a complete made up fantasy, then you would be considering that the Arabs tell us that the Great Pyramid was not a tomb. These people are telling us in no uncertain terms whatsoever that they knew exactly what the Great Pyramid was built for. They tell us that the Great Pyramid is associated with Hermes, that it was built to protect ancient knowledge and artifacts from a coming disaster, but these are only clues and ones that should not be dismissed because we know there was a great event in the past that crippled life to the brink of extinction. Our trauma has stopped our remembrance from the cataclysm, but there are other locations close to the region that see similar preparations for a coming event. The point in all this is that the Great Pyramid, and the Giza Pyramids for that matter, were long in existence when the era known as the Dynastic Egyptians emerged. The Old Kingdom are removed from the Middle Kingdom monarchs by thousands of years. This is clear and even if Egyptologists are not going to look at this, then we certainly will. It's the timeline of the past we should be looking at. Put the existence of the Great Pyramid back past 12,000 years as the Arab historians maintain that the pyramid was a chamber to withstand cataclysmic occurrences and preserve the past. In this sense, the Pyramid of Giza is an effort to remember the past and perhaps these people are telling us that the next cycle of cataclysm, when the Sphinx fixes its gaze with the star Regulus, this is the 26,000 year cycle that the ancients are reaching across millennia to tell us about. These people were not primitive. They knew of a coming event. They tried to leave us a time capsule in the form of the Great Pyramid and they left this place as a warning system. These are the three stages of existence of the ancient monument. Our history is stranger than the fiction. The truth is stranger than fiction. That should be the weird point in all of this. We have a mentality where we don't believe truth and in fact, Truth is strange to us because it is kept from us. When the Great Pyramid was built, the measurement of the entire Earth was known. This civilization had the means of measuring our planet and they placed the Great Pyramid bang in the middle of all the Earth landmass. They recorded this for a reason, that a technologically advanced culture would emerge and notice these highly advanced associations. This place was put here for a reason. It wasn't to assist a pharaoh's journey to the afterlife. It was to warn us that the future and according to the Arabs, major artifacts were placed inside. Ones we can only speculate about like the connection with the Ark of the Covenant with the King's Chamber sarcophagus. These are the clues we shouldn't be dismissing. The history of civilization, the lost civilization described by Edgar Cayce of the Atlantean civilization, is preserved in three great halls of records at various intervals in the Earth's landmass. In front of the Sphinx is one of these halls and a transcript of Cayce's vision reveals the following. In an induced state, the late great Edgar Cayce was asked, give in detail what the sealed room at Giza contains. His reply was as follows. A record of Atlantis from the beginning of that period when the spirit took form and began an encasement of 
the land and the development of the people throughout their existence at this location. With the record of the first destruction and what took place in the land, with the record of the stay of the people and their activities elsewhere, with a record of the meetings of all nations. For the activities that became necessary with the final destruction of Atlantis and the building of the Pyramid of Intention. The Great Pyramid with whom, what or were would come, the opening of the records that are copies from the sunken Atlantean Empire. For the change coming from the Earth, it must rise again. This sealed chamber in position lies as the sun rises from the waters. The line of shadow falls between the paws of the Great Sphinx of Giza that was later tasked with guarding this chamber but may not be entered by the connecting chambers within the Sphinx itself or the right paw until the right times has been fulfilled when the changes must be active in the sphere of man's experiences and struggles. It is between the Sphinx and the Nile. These transcripts are suggesting that whoever opens the lost, hidden vault in the Chamber of Records, the name of that person is already written. This is the prophecy that Edgar Cayce unleashed. If we look back at the history books regarding this prophecy, then we do find curious connections. The 4th century philosopher Lamblichus, for example, suggests that the Finks serves as an entrance point to sacred corridors of a lost people. This philosopher suggests that the chamber either in or near the Sphinx contained inscriptions and records that are the very foundations of all knowledge, including the unlearned and unknown. Some suggest the secret chamber is in fact the Great Pyramid as asserted by the Arabs as historical fact that the Great Pyramid is the chamber of knowledge. Built to withstand the cataclysm 12,500 years ago, the Younger Dryas impact event. The mystery of ancient Giza and what the pyramids are is the subject of the most mind-boggling array of theories ever established. The lost civilization that built these things knew they were leaving a message. The answer, it seems, is in the very foundation upon which these pyramids lay. The mound in front of the Sphinx is curious. Perhaps some sort of frequency sound triggers the mechanism to open the locked chamber. Johannes Helfrich, the artist who created this abomination of the ancient wonder, suggests that he encountered a secret passage there in 1579. He says in his travel log that you could enter this passage and project your voice as if you were the Sphinx itself. Maybe this is what happened when the Sphinx spoke to Thotmos, Perhaps a priest hid in the secret chamber and instructed him to recover the monument in Pharaoh's likeness. But perhaps this chamber can also generate a frequency that would literally see the chamber of records awake from the slumber in the sands of time. The mound in front of the Sphinx is 200 yards from the Sphinx face. The Great Pyramid is the stuff of legend. Nothing at all is out of the question as to what it may be. The late great Edgar Cayce suggests it is older than 10,500 years old at the most delayed estimate possible. Cayce was an intellect, he was brilliant. Playing upon emotions, he would diagnose underlying illnesses to the would-be believer. His charm, it seemed, was part of the trick. That is, until you realize he wasn't fooling you. He was predicting with accuracy the things he had no business knowing and for these accuracies, he is renowned. In a semi-conscious state, he would describe incredible things relating to Egypt, in particular the Great Sphinx. He tells us that the Sphinx and the pyramids are remnants of a third world age, a time when the old age collapsed. He was adamant in his detail, hall of records and passages in front of the right paw of the Sphinx. In fact, he even foresaw an underground pyramid in front of the ancient monument. Casey, who died in 1945, saw that refugees from the lost empire of Atlantis buried their secrets in a hall of records under the Sphinx and that the hall would be discovered. This ties in with what the Arabs are saying about the Great Pyramid. Their legend maintains that the Great Pyramid was in fact a great vehicle of the past, an engine of humanity's brilliance. 
And at this place, the secrets were stored to survive the collapse of the third wave of existence. Unfortunately, that is now lost, plundered, and even stolen by would-be invaders who only had their minds set on wealth and riches. Our attention and hope, therefore, lies in the possibility of the Great Chamber Vault of Records being unexplored in front of the Sphinx. Our history stretches longer than we are accepting, you know, thousands or even tens of thousands of years ago. Someone had the idea to build a pyramid. Not only that, it seemed before they had done so that they also measured the Earth before plunking this thing bang in the middle. The information maintained in the dimensions of this ancient monument has astounded our understanding today. What good reason did they have for undertaking the construction of a monument that confounds logical understanding? They are obviously reaching across time to tell us something, right? According to the Pyramid Odyssey in 1977, Stanford research conducted acoustic surveys that revealed Edgar Cayce's predictions may be true. Chambers discovered on the Giza Plateau, including four shafts, linked by tunnels around the Sphinx, one of them dramatically under the right paw. Casey's description suggests ancient records are located at this feature, though it has never been excavated. These results do suggest that there are chambers here yet to be found. Of course, we are only now relying on modern techniques like LIDAR to scan these anomalies where possible, but the fact that these results came 32 years after the life of Edgar Casey is mind-boggling. He said that there are texts in a combination of old and newer writings, describing the newer text as Atlantean. The reemergence, the Atlanteans, and the Sphinx is but one of the three locations where these identical texts are stored on the Earth. There is a mound in front of the Sphinx that has never been excavated. In 1935, news was breaking out across the world that a new city had been discovered. Incredibly, these headlines are now the subject of a falsified debate regarding the ancient wonders. The headline declared, a highly organized civilization had existed 4,000 years ago. Now it seems the denial is rife of such discoveries. The Vant Denon sketch of the Sphinx in 1798 depicts a man being pulled out of a hole in the Sphinx head, a hole that was still there in the 1920s during aerial photography of the area. Efforts to study the monument had been blocked by the Egyptian authorities for now. The ancient beast still protects all that is lost and unknown. Also, by the way, just thought we would mention that the 14-year restoration of the Step Pyramid is now finished. There were fears of a collapse after an earthquake in 1992, but it seems the engineers are now satisfied that it will maintain. Conservators strengthened the pyramid by filling in gaps in its six rectangular mastabis with stone blocks. The interior chamber and passages through the pyramid were also restored over 14 years of conservation and restoration. The effect and legacy of the Great Pyramid was not only felt in the ancient world, the confounding masterpiece was the subject of replica grave markers during the period of Egyptology in the 19th and 20th century. The confusion surrounding what it is has led the world in a falsified direction as immortalized in the monument of Maria Christina of Austria. The direction of understanding has blinded us. We were told what it was. This is the point here. We were told this was a fact and we believed without questioning this because we were under the impression we were learning something new. Only now are we realizing this. The pyramid is a major influencer in world understanding. The hidden knowledge it seems is too precious to share publicly. If anyone has ever uncovered these hidden truths, then perhaps they have replicated it. Maybe in a highly exploratory manner, World governments and private researchers have secretly studied the dimensions of the monument and exercised a public experiment in a very secretive architectural type of way, maybe. All across the world, the Great Pyramid has been replicated. From Paris to Cleveland, architectural masterpieces have been erected as an apparent hat tip as to the influence the pyramid may be having. The entrance to the most visited museum in the entire world is the Great Pyramid. Well. Not exactly, but the influence on show for all of us to see as Paris boasts of understanding of all things ancient in a secretive yet public kind of way. The symbolism here is suggestive. 
you enter the pyramid and go all the way down to the museum. The Tablet of Thoth suggests that the pyramid is a marker, an entrance point to something hidden deep beneath the rock, which is the Great Pyramid. These tablets tell us that the Sphinx was a lion that acts as a resting place for an underground technology that can be accessed via the Great Pyramid. Though these translations and even the validity of the Emerald Tablet is highly debatable. The Lu Pyramid, as it's known, fills the underground museum with chasms of natural light. Opened in 1989 at an eye-watering cost of 7 billion French francs, the inverted pyramid feature hangs into the museum like a hanging spike. Alone this feature was $3 million. With a square base and an apex of 71 feet, 21 meters, its dimensions form a miniature Great Pyramid of Giza. This pyramid caused a sensation in the 80s and still maintains the power of wonder today. The Emerald Tablet was apparently discovered in Turkey as described in the book of Balinus. Following Balinus, we can trace the text to Hugo Santaya, who translated it to Latin in the 12th century. This allowed an understanding of translation by Isaac Newton that has been adopted and generally understood to read word for word as follows. I Thoth, the master of mysteries, keeper of records, mighty king, magician, living from generation to generation, being about to pass into the halls of Amenti, set down for the guidance of those that are to come after, these records of the mighty wisdom of the great empire. In the great city of Kior on the island of Undal, in a time far past, I began this incarnation, not as the little men of the present age did the mighty ones of old live and die, but rather from eon to eon did they renew their life in the halls of Amenti, where the river of life flows eternally onward. A hundred times ten have I descended the dark way that led into light, and as many times have I ascended from the darkness into the light, my strength and power renewed. Now for a time I descended, and the men of alchemy shall know me no more. But in a time yet unborn will I rise again, mighty and potent, requiring an accounting of those left behind me. Then beware, O men of alchemy, if ye falsely betray my teaching, for I shall cast you down from your high estate into the darkness of the caves from whence ye came. Betray not my secrets to the men of the north or the men of the south, lest my curse fall upon ye. Remember and heed my words, for surely will I return again and require of thee that which ye guard. I, even from beyond time and from beyond death, will I return, rewarding or punishing as ye have requited your trust. Great were my people in the ancient days, great beyond the conception of the little people now around me, knowing the wisdom of old, seeking far within the heart of infinity, knowledge that belonged to earth's youth. Wise we were with the wisdom of the children of light who dwelt among us. Strong were we with the power drawn from the eternal fire. And all of these, greatest among the children of men, was my father, thought me, keeper of the great temple, link between the children of light who dwelt within the temple and the races of men who inhabited the ten islands, mouthpiece after the three of the dweller of Unal, speaking to the kings with a voice that must be obeyed. Grew I there from a child into manhood, being taught by my father the elder mysteries, until in time there grew within the fire of wisdom, until it burst into a consuming flame. Not desired I, but the attainment of wisdom, until a great day that command came from the dweller of the temple, that I be brought before him. Few there were among the children of men who had looked upon the mighty face and lived, for not as the sons of men are the children of light, when they are not incarnate in a physical body. Chosen was I from the sons of men, taught by the dweller that his purpose might be fulfilled, purposes yet unborn in the womb of time. Long ages I dwelt in the temple, learning ever and yet ever more wisdom, until I too approached the light emitted from the great fire. Taught me he the path to Amenti, the underworld where the great king sits upon his throne of might. Deep I bowed in homage before the lords of life and the lords of death, receiving as my gift the key of life. Free was I of the halls of Amenti, 
bound not by death to the circle of life. Far to the stars I journeyed until space and time became as naught. Then, having drunk deep of the cup of wisdom, I looked into the hearts of men, and there found I great mysteries and was glad. For only in the search for truth could my soul be stilled and the flame within be quenched. Down through the ages I lived, seeing those around me taste of the cup of death and return again in the light of life. Gradually from the kingdoms of the empire passed waves of consciousness that had been one with me, only to be replaced by spawn of a lower star. In obedience to the law, the word of the master grew into flower. Downward into darkness turned the thoughts of the ancients until at last in this wrath arose from his aguanti, the dweller speaking the word, calling the power. Deep in earth's heart, the sons of Amenti heard, and hearing, directing the change of the flower of fire that burns eternally, changing and shifting, using the logos, until the great fire changed its direction. Over the world then broke the great waters, drowning and sinking, changing earth's balance until only the temple of light was left, standing on the great mountain of Undal, still rising out of the water. Some there were who were living, saved from the rush of the fountains. Called to me then the master, saying, Gather ye together, my people. Take them by the arts ye have learned of far across the waters, until ye reach the land of the hairy barbarians, dwelling in caves of the desert. Follow there the plan that ye know of. Gathered I then my people, and entered the great ship of the Master. Upward we rose into the morning. Dark beneath us lay the temple. Suddenly over it rose the waters, vanished from earth, until the time appointed was the great temple. Fast we fled toward the sun of the morning, until beneath us lay the land of the children of alchemy. Raging they came with cudgels and spears, lifted in anger, seeking to slay and utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. Then raised I my staff and directed a ray of vibration, striking them still in their tracks as fragments of stone of the mountain. Then spoke I to them in words calm and peaceful, telling them of the might of Atlantis, saying we were children of the sun and its messengers. Cowed I them by my display of magic science, until at my feet they groveled when I released them. Long dwelt we in the land of Egypt, long and yet long again, until obeying the commands of the Master, who, while sleeping yet lives eternally, I sent from me the sons of Atlantis, sent them in many directions, that from the womb of time wisdom might rise again in her children. Long time dwelt I in the land of Egypt, doing great works by the wisdom within me, Upward grew into the light of knowledge the children of Egypt, watered by the rains of my wisdom. Blasted I then a path to Amenti so that I might retain my powers, living from age to age a son of Atlantis, keeping the wisdoms, preserving the records. Grew great the sons of Egypt, conquering the people around them, growing slowly upward in soul force. Now for a time I go from among them into the dark halls of Amenti deep in the halls of the earth, before the lords of the powers, face to face once again with the dweller, raised I high over the entrance, a doorway, a gateway leading down to Amenti. Few there would be with courage to dare it, few pass the portal to dark Amenti. Raised over the passage, I, a mighty pyramid, using the power that overcomes earth's gravity, deep and yet deeper place I a force house or chamber, from it carved I a circular passage, reaching almost to the great summit. There in the apex set I the crystal, sending the ray into the time-space, drawing the force from out of the ether, concentrating upon the gateway to Amenti. Other chambers I built and left vacant to all seeming, yet hidden within them are the key to Amenti. He who in courage would dare the dark realms, let him be purified first by long fasting. Lie in the sarcophagus of stone in my chamber. Then reveal I to him the great mysteries. Soon shall he follow to where I shall meet him. Even in the darkness of earth shall I meet him. I, Thoth, Lord of Wisdom, meet him and hold him and dwell with him 
always. Build I the Great Pyramid, patterned after the Pyramid of Earth Force, burning eternally so that it, too, might remain through the ages. In it I build my knowledge of magic science, so that I might be here when again I return from Amenti. I, while I sleep in the halls of Amenti, my soul roaming free will incarnate, dwell among men in this form or another. Hermes thrice born, emissary on earth and I the dweller, fulfilling his commands so many might be lifted. Now return I to the halls of Amenti, leaving behind me some of my wisdom. Preserve ye and keep ye the command of the dweller, lift ever upwards your eyes towards the light. Surely in time ye are one with the master. Surely by right ye are the one with the master. Surely by right yet are one with the all. Now I depart from ye. Know my commandments, keep them and be them, and I will be with you, helping and guiding you into the light. Now before me opens the portal, go I down in the darkness of night. No one knows what became of the original tablet. What remains are translations and translations of translations, along with a historic timeline punctuated with disconnects and gaps. The tablet appears and disappears across the ancient world before and after the birth of Christ with periods of revival, including the Italian Renaissance. One of the most mysterious documents ever put before the eyes of man, the Emerald Tablet has been described as everything from a succinct summary of philosophy to an extraterrestrial artifact or a gift from the lost civilization, a time when gods walked among us. Believed to have been a contemporary of the historical Abraham of the Old Testament, Hermes Trismegistus was said to have traveled throughout Egypt, Greece, and Mesopotamia. He was associated with Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom, writing, magic, and the sciences, patron god of the sacred scribes. Thoth's name and qualities were synonymous with the Greek god Hermes, and the earthly Hermes, honorific Trismegistus, translates to thrice great. Some assert that the man was, in fact, God's incarnation.